They came before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America. By Ivan Van Schertema. Chapter 9 African Egyptian Presences in Ancient America. Is there any other spot on earth so completely enwrapped in darkness, so mute in the face of all our questions? How to explain why several of the urn figures seem to depict an Egyptian sphinx, another the bird-headed god Ra, and why the reliefs in the gallery of the dancers are partly in Assyrian style, partly the portrayal of Negroid types. How? Why? Whence? Egon Erwin Kish and Dekugan in Mexico we can trace the progress of man in Mexico without noting any definite old world influence during this period, 1000 to 650 BC, except a strong Negroid substratum connected with the magicians. Frederick A. Peterson, Ancient Mexico. In 1938, Dr. Matthew Sterling led a joint team from the Smithsonian Institution and the National Geographic Society into the Gulf of Mexico to an obscure spot about a mile outside the village of Tre Zipotes. There, a year earlier, following up a rumor that some Mexican peasants had come upon a huge stone head in 1858 but had left it to sink back into its grave, Sterling uncovered what looked like the helmeted dome of that head. Spying out the land within the vicinity of this find, Sterling realized that the head was not buried in isolation, but, as certain large mounds indicated, in the company of other huge and probably related objects. To uncover all these would call for a major digging operation. Sterling therefore returned home to raise money and a team to do the digging. That team which he brought back with him into the jungles of Veracruz in 1939, was to unearth some of the most startling archaeological finds in American history. Sterling's description of these finds is steeped in his excitement and wonder. When the first head had completely emerged from the dark alluvial soil, he found it, in spite of its great size, to be carved from a single block of basalt, and to be a head only, resting upon a prepared foundation of unworked slabs of stone. Cleared of the surrounding earth, it presented an awe-inspiring spectacle. Despite its great size, the workmanship is delicate and sure, and proportions perfect. Unique in character among Aboriginal American sculptures, it is remarkable for its realistic treatment. The features are bold and amazingly Negroid in character. This Negroid head was found only 10 miles away from the source of the stone from which it was made. The basalt had come from the base of Mount Tuxtla, but was extraordinarily was that the single block of stone from which Native Americans had chiseled this portrait was 6 feet high and 18 feet in circumference, weighing over 10 tons. To bring it from the base of the mountain, to the place where it was found called for it to be transported over a 30-foot deep gorge. This problem, remarked Sterling, would tax the ingenuity of an engineer with the benefit of modern machinery. The ancient engineers, however, performed the feat of successfully quarrying a flawless block of basalt and transporting it in perfect condition without the aid of the wheel or domestic animals. As the diggings at this location continued, a long slab of stone was found, a stele, with dots and crosses, which, when deciphered, yielded a precise date, November 4, 291 B.C. This dating caused an uproar in archaeological circles, and the Herbert Spindon scale for calculating American time inscriptions, which had been used to arrive at this date, was vigorously challenged. Ten years later, carbon dating, which were only introduced as late as 1946 into archaeological studies, were made at a different site, 
Tikal in Guatemala. And these proved that the spending reading of American dots and crosses in no way overestimated the antiquity of objects. It was far more accurate, these carbon-14 tests established, than the Goodman-Martinez-Thompson scale, which had given much later dates. The year 291 BC was startlingly enough. It was the earliest date then known for any American cultural find, but greater supply prizes were in store. Larger heads, earlier dates, more important sites were revealed as the diggings in Middle America were extended and intensified. They exposed the false, frail ground upon which the historical outlines of pre-Columbian American history had so far been built. Fourteen years before Sterling's expedition to trade Sapotes, a team from Tulane University had found a giant stone head pushing out of the ground at La Venta in the Mexican state of Tabasco, about 18 miles inland from the Gulf of Mexico. The Tulane team, headed by Franz Blom and Oliver Lafarge, was only passing through the area and did not have time to dig, but it recorded its find in a photograph. Sterling was struck by something in this photograph. Although only the top of the head could be seen, the dome-like helmet on this buried figure seemed to match the one he had excavated at Tres Sapotes. Suspecting a link, he headed toward La Venta on his next expedition. What he found there not only confirmed his suspicions, but made his work at the former site seem minor in comparison. When, after a relentless search, this head eventually emerged, it was found to be eight feet high, and like the one at Tres Sapotes, vividly negroid. A native boy, observing the diggings, had seen outcroppings of stone not far from his father's place and led the expedition to that spot. Three more negroid heads were uncovered. Two of them were so realistic in detail that they even had their teeth carved out. A very unusual thing in American art. Massive, military, menacing, they stood, faces of pure basalt stone, dominating the vast ceremonial plaza in which they were found. The lines of cheek and jaw, the fullness of the lips, the broadly fleshed noses, the acutely observed and faithfully reproduced facial contour and particulars bore eloquent witness to a Negro African presence. One of the Negro colossi, eight and a half feet high and twenty-two feet in circumference, wore earplugs with a cross carved in each. They all wore headdresses that were foreign and distinctive, domed helmets like those of ancient soldiers. They all faced east, staring into the Atlantic. Four negroid heads in all were excavated at La Venta. The largest of the four, nine feet high, had its dome top flattened so that it could function as an altar. A speaking tube was found going in at the ear and out of the mouth. It was used as an oracle, a talking god. It was also, according to Sterling, associated with the first construction phase of the ceremonial court, which went through three phases or alterations. The significance of this and of other objects found on the site could not be assessed until some very hard dating by scientific methods could be obtained. It was not until excavations in 1955 and 1956 by members of a National Geographic Smithsonian University of California expedition that the carbon-14 datings began. These were published in 1957. They were astonishing. At the place where the Negroid figures in association with the Caucasoid figure with the beard were found, the La Venta ceremonial court, nine samples of wood charcoal were taken. Five of these samples related to the original construction of the court. They gave an average reading of 814 BC, plus or minus 134 years. In other words, the living human figures upon which these heads were modeled could not have appeared at Leventa later than 680 BC, and could have entered the Gulf of Mexico any time between 
the average 800 BC date and the 680 BC date, a period which roughly spans the 25th dynasty of Egypt. Carbon datings cannot be contested, but they must allow for a margin of error about a century either way from the date assessed from the samples of organic material. Most Americanists using other yardsticks to narrow down this margin agree on 800 BC as the earliest date for the Leventa site. A study of the known history of the period spanned by these dates illuminated by other data for example aspects of their attire, the relationship of the figures found in juxtaposition, the incidence of foreign cultural elements may help us to arrive at a more specific dating. I would put it within the nine years between 688 BC, the year of Taharqa's assumption of the double crown of Egypt, his movement north, the beginning of his construction of a new pharaonic palace and gardens at Memphis, the first place of his diplomatic campaign of alliances and military preparation against the Assyrians, and the year 680 BC, the latest possible date for the foreigners to be represented in the first phase of the construction of the ceremonial court. Let it be noted, however, that this is simply a selection of the likeliest period and the likeliest set of circumstances. The capacities, the pressures, the potential maritime trading relationship between the black rulers of Egypt and the Phoenician vassals of Assyria existed all through the period 730 BC to 650 BC. From Pianchi's assumption of power over both Upper and Lower Egypt to the sack of Thebes and the final defeat of Taharqa and his nephew Tanu Taman by the Assyrian king Ashur Bani Pal, the Nubian militia was also a major determinant in Egyptian power politics for centuries preceding the emergence of this black dynasty. Nubia, by her wealth and the power of her army, became a decisive factor in the power politics of Egypt as early as 1085 BC, even before the actual conquest of Egypt by the black kings of Kush. That these aliens entered the Gulf of Mexico during the original construction of the ceremonial court not later than 680 BC is borne out by several factors. One was Sterling's discovery of evidence which indicated that the oracular Negroid stone face with the altar on the dome of its head was among the oldest of the figures at the Leventa ceremonial site. Another was the fact that this face and the others were so huge and dominating that they must have affected the shape and size of the ceremonial court itself, presumably built to accommodate and venerate them. La Venta culture itself, or rather the culture of the Omex, runs from circa 800 to circa 400 BC. The original court was renovated and altered three times and it is from the sampling of the original construction phase and the three renovation phases that the archaeologists who did the test, Philip Drucker, Robert Heiser, and Robert Squire, were able to arrive at the earliest and latest limits of Olmec civilization. During these site construction phases, there is no evidence that any significant culture change occurred. In other words, what began to shape Olmec culture at La Venta in the first construction phase dominated it to the last, 400 to 325 BC, when the Olmecs abandoned the site. This fact is important in establishing the arrival of foreigners in the first phase, not later than 680 BC, for if they arrived afterward, the massive reconstruction work that the sudden and spectacular introduction of the massive stone sculptures would have imposed on the original site and the changes it would have wrought upon the culture would have shown up very clearly in the archaeological evidence. We wish to emphasize, says the joint report of the Drucker Heiser Squire team, that these later dates refer to site construction phases only, not cultural stages. We found no evidence of cultural change during the time complex. A. The ceremonial site was in use. 
the Olmecs were a people of three faces. That is, a people formed from three main sources or influences. One of these faces was Mongoloid. Elements of this Mongoloid strain may have come into America from Asia even after the famous glacial migration across the Bering Straits. But they would have blended indistinguishably with the Ice Age Americans. The second face or influence was Negroid. The third suggests a trace of Mediterranean Caucasoids, some with Semitic noses, probably Phoenician. But this will be shown to be related historically to the second. These faces became one face, to which the broad name Olmec was given. I think it is necessary to make it clear, since partisan and ethnocentric scholarship seems to be the order of the day, that the emergence of the Negroid face which the archaeological and cultural data overwhelmingly confirms, in no way presupposes the lack of a native originality, the absence of other influences, or the automatic eclipse of other faces. Fusion is the marriage, not the fatal collision of cultures. Leventa was not alone in its depiction of Negroid faces in stone. Apart from the four found there, Two were excavated in Tres Sepotes, and five at San Lorenzo and Veracruz, one of which, the largest known, is nine feet four inches high. Further archaeological evidence of the Negroid presence in ancient America is found in stone reliefs associated with an American culture, which in its first phase was contemporaneous with the last phase of Olmec culture, and strongly influenced by it. This was the culture of the Monte Alban, located southwest of Leventa, in what is known as the Temple of the Danzantes, dancing figures. A stone-faced platform contemporary with the first occupation of Monte Alban is found in a series of base-relief figures on large stone slabs. Over 140 of these figures, most of them Negroid types and Negroid Mongoloid mixtures, seem to be swimming or dancing in a viscous fluid. Some of them are old bearded men. They all have closed eyes, open mouths, and are completely nude. On closer inspection, we find that this is no ritual dance at all, but men crumpled into grotesque postures by mortal agony. As Michael Cole has pointed out, the curiously distorted posture of the limbs, the open mouth, and closed eyes indicate that they are corpses. Other evidence, such as the mutilation of the sex on some of the figures, with a depiction of blood streaming in flowery patterns from the severed part, suggest that they were violently killed. The fact that these corpses were given greater prominence than any other figures at Monte Alban is partly responsible for Michael Cole's assertion that they were undoubtedly chiefs and kings slain by the earliest rulers of Monte Alban. We are therefore left with a picture of a group of Negroid and Negroid Mongoloid elements, a second or third generation of the original visitors to La Venta migrating southwest to Monte Alban only to meet with a violent end. Whatever happened to this migratory group? It did not spell the end to the influence of the Negroid element in early American cultures. This influence, as marked by the distribution of the Negroid colossi, radiated outward from La Venta into Tres Zapotes and San Lorenzo and Veracruz. In the southeastern corner of Veracruz, the state where the largest of the Negroid colossi were found, archaeologists have turned up an Egyptian bas relief carving of a Semite on the back of a Totonac slate mirror. In Monte Alban itself, where the Negroid dancers or death figures were engraved, Carvings closely resembling an Egyptian sphinx and the Egyptian god Ra in its bird aspect 
appear at the same location. Furthermore, when we move with the wave of Olmec culture sweeping slowly down through that narrow corridor of land that joins the two Americas, linking Mexico in the north with the world of Peru in the south, we come upon the most concrete evidence of an Egyptian presence. This is a find of patently Egyptian statuettes buried three meters deep in the eastern beaches of Acajutla in San Salvador. John Sorensen has documented the find, which is now on exhibit in the Museo Nacional, David J. Guzman, San Salvador. A stratum three meters deep brings us clearly within the centuries of the Negro-Egyptian contact with the Olmec world. What has been made of all this? What theories have been advanced to account for the presence of Negroes in ancient America and for Egyptian and Mediterranean elements in the Olmec heartland? Speculations about an Egyptian influence on pre-Christian America go back almost to the beginnings of Egyptology, long before the discovery and dating of the Negroid heads and Egyptian statuettes in Middle America. These speculations sprang, however, from the pens of Romantics, dazzled by sensational legends of the lost city of Atlantis, or facile diffusionists who saw the world as one vast ecumeny and made sweeping claims for all kinds of old world presences in America, building up their case on the most superficial resemblances, cultural items drawn from all time levels and all possible and impossible places. In their own game of fantasy, they jumped at a hundred items belonging to no one cultural milieu or social complex, no particular or definitive period in old world history. The truth was that until 1955-1956, when carbon datings were at last obtained at the Laventa site, these impatient gentlemen were pounding at a closed door. We were given the keys to this mysterious chamber of history only three decades ago. Constance Irving was the first writer to make known to the general public some of the implications of these discoveries. Before her book appeared in 1963, only a few archaeologists knew about these heads, and the information was relegated to technical journals. Some scholars, finding it embarrassing to their already settled notions of American history, chose to ignore its existence. Some concentrated on the Caucasoid-type figure, nicknamed Uncle Sam, rejoicing in the belief that they had at last found proof of a white god of civilization, turning a blind eye on the massive Negroid figure standing beside him. Some picked upon the one smiling Negroid face among the quaternity of heads, nicknaming it Baby Face so as to blur the obvious and inescapable distinction between the colossal, realistic representations of the aliens in stone and the smooth, dwarf-like, mongoloid figures in clay and jadeite littered beside them. These little figures, in contrast, were stylized in the typical jaguar motif of the Olmecs, with snarling feline mouths, sexless bodies, and infantile faces. Thus has a generation of scholars contrived to silence and sidestep these uncomfortable discoveries. Irwin stepped into the breach with a bold and plausible theory which seemed at first to tie up most of the pieces. She began by looking closely at strange cultural items on these figures. The blacks wore dome-shaped covers on their heads which looked like quote, football helmets, or upturned kettles, end quote. The large Caucasoid figure, nicknamed Uncle Sam by archaeologists, wore, quote, turned-up shoes, end quote. With respect to the latter, Irwin pointed out 
that there were only three peoples in the ancient world during this time that wore turned up shoes. These were the Etruscans, the Hittites, and the Phoenicians. The Etruscans, she claimed, though she hedged this with qualifiers, were, quote, the least likely to have found their way to American shores. The Hittites were land-bound, but apart from that, their empire had disintegrated at the critical period of contact, and they were dispersed in refugee pockets among their neighbors in the Mediterranean, with whom they not only intermingled, but intermarried. Among their neighbors were the Phoenicians, to whom the Hittite custom of turned up shoes diffused. The Phoenicians were, by simple process of elimination, the most logical choice for the identity of the Mediterranean type figure at La Venta. Moreover, they had a good navy. They were trading along the Mediterranean, seeking metal supplies from places far distant from their island complex. To cap it all, a model of the ancient Phoenician god Melkart had turned up in Rio Balsas, Mexico. Miss Irwin then posed the critical question. What did the Phoenicians have to do with the Negroid figures dominating the Laventa ceremonial site? For the answer, she turned to an Assyrian source which described Phoenician ambassadors and their servants coming to pay tribute to the Assyrian court, circa 849 BC. The source describes the headgear of the servants who, quote, bore kettles on their heads like caps, end quote. Since one or two people had casually mentioned that the Negroid stone figures at Laventa were what looked like upturned kettles, Irwin pounced on the image and suggested that these figures were quote, a cargo of captured blacks, end quote, whom the Phoenicians had turned into their servants, hence the kettle-like caps. Let us look at her source closely. Nowhere does it mention blacks as servants of the Phoenicians. The Phoenicians, in this quotation, came to pay tribute to their Assyrian overlords, they were in a state of humble vassalage during the period dated by the quotation, circa 849 BC. When the Nubian blacks had gained full independence from Egypt, these blacks in this historical period were servants of no one. The Phoenicians remained in that lowly state all during the time the blacks moved to a position of ascendancy from the 9th to the 7th century BC. The Phoenicians, in fact, during the whole phase of Laventa culture, first phase of Laventa culture, right down to 680 BC, were either vassals of Assyria or mercenaries and protected traders of a Nubian controlled Egypt. What is more, the quotation has been ingeniously stretched to convey the impression that the kettles were worn rather than born. A full, unprejudiced reading simply shows us that every available carrying space on these porter servants was weighted down with tribute. They bore trays of sweetmeats in their hands, boxes laden with blue wool, and ingots of gold, silver, and lead on their shoulders, and kettles, that is, receptacles of liquid or solid food, on their heads. They bore not wore these kettles, and the word like in the phrase like caps comes to mean in place of, in the manner of, and not serving the same function as. This style of porterage in which the head is covered or capped by pots or kettles or saucepans of food is quite common to many cultures. One does not have to be a clever linguist to see how forced and inauthentic the association is. But there is something else that led to Irvin's assumption that these Negroes were, quote, a car cargo of captured blacks, end quote. 
After the Assyrians drove the Nubians out of Egypt, they installed a vassal king, Necho. His successor, Necho II, 609 to 593 BC, assumed mastery of Egypt when Assyrian power was on the decline. He hired Phoenician navigators to circle Africa to see if such a thing were possible. They started out from the Red Sea port of Ezion Geber, proceeded down along the east coast of Africa, rounded the Cape, sailed up along the west coast, and entered the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar, returning thus to Egypt. The round trip took them three years. Evidence for the authenticity of this trip lies in a very strange reading of the sun's position taken when rounding the Cape, a reading which could not have been invented, the validity of which has been cross-checked by later navigators. What Irwin is suggesting is that somewhere around this time, 613 to 580 BC, her dates, when the Phoenicians were getting acquainted with Africa, they took some West Africans captive, brought them aboard a ship, turned them into their servants, put on the kettle cap, and got themselves blown off course to America. There are three objections to this story. First of all, it is nearly a hundred years later than the latest possible date for the arrival of the Negroid figures at La Venta. 680, not 580 BC. Her downdating is largely influenced by the fact that it was a more favorable period for Phoenician enterprise at sea. I have already pointed to Sterling's evidence that the oracular Negroid figure belongs to the first phase of the construction of the ceremonial site and to the joint report of Drucker, Heiser, and Squire indicating that there was no significant change of culture in the succeeding phases. To place the arrival of the outsiders and their cultural impact in the second phase therefore is irresponsible. Second, if the Phoenicians had made servants of the blacks, why were those so-called captives and servants given such prominence among the Native Americans? dwarfing their so-called masters. There were 11 Negroid colossi in all found in the Olmec world. Four of these dominated the Leventa site. Against these massive figures was one major Mediterranean type Caucasoid. The Mediterranean figure with a beard is seven feet in height, carved on a stele which he shares with a headless companion. This is a flat representation or drawing, whereas the Negroid heads are full-bodied, realistic sculptures of great size, nearly ten times larger than life. Do people build monuments and altars and oracles to slaves, which surpass in significance, size, and number those representing their masters? Here is no attempt whatever to perceive the relationship created by the historical realities of the period. All we have, in spite of a revolutionary pre-Columbian find, is a reactionary post-Columbian reflex. Black man found standing beside white man. Relationship? Black man obviously servant or captive or slave. White man obviously master. History in this conception has not changed one whit. 676 BC, AD 1976. Races and people seemed frozen in an immemorial, immemorial stance. Third, the very kettle cap, which was conveniently clamped upon the heads of the black colossi to bring them down to size as, quote, servants, unquote, turns out upon examination to be the type of battle helmet the Nubians and Egyptians wore in the contact period. This may be demonstrated by a relief from the temple of Ramses III at Medinet Habu, Thebes, 
where a naval battle is in progress between the Egyptians, who wear these helmets with ear flaps, while the enemy wear crests, the Philistine soldiers, and horn helmets, the Sheridan soldiers. James barely recognizes these helmets as military apparel, but falls by virtue of the same automatic racial reflex into the same trap as Irwin. He conceives of the blacks in ancient America as, quote, mercenary troops, end quote, of the Phoenicians. It does not occur to him that the Phoenicians were the mercenaries of the Egyptians, and that in that period, in question, they were in no position to make mercenaries of anyone, least of all the blacks, who, as then rulers of Egypt, were their protectors against a common enemy, the Assyrians. He talks glibly about the planting of Phoenician colonies along the seaboard of West Africa, circa 425 BC. Not only is the period too late for our consideration, but the kind of quote, master mercenary unquote relationship he envisions between the Phoenicians and the blacks has no foundation in history. Moreover, a great number of these so-called colonizers of West Africa were killed, absorbed, or turned into captive and slaves. Even if, to flatter his fantasy, we were to assume that the Phoenicians paid Africans to join their fleet and fight Native Americans for their territory, why should these people, crushed and humiliated by black mercenaries, build altars and monuments to them? out of gratitude for being, quote, civilized? It's the old colonial fairy story. Its patent absurdity may not strike a man who can refer with insensitive and myopic dogmatism to, quote, Africa that never outside Egypt came to anything momentous, end quote. One cannot deny, however, the imagination and scholarship of these two writers. Irwin is sound and cautious on most things. James Bailey, though he traffics in sensational superficialities, has done some impressive research. He throws a wide net over Bronze Age civilizations and brings up a rich catch of relevant and irrelevant oddities. Both share, however, the same basic weakness, an inability to look through the window of ancient history with eyes untinted by the ethnocentric dyes of their day. They and others have begun to provide a new script for the pre-Columbian drama of America. All the characters in the old world seem to have been given new lines, all except the Negro. What was the impact of these aliens, the Negroid and Mediterranean figures, upon Olmec culture? How can we distinguish between what they found on their arrival and what they brought with them? How can a responsible list of loans be drawn up that we may deem a reliable index of cultural contact and influence? Vague coincidences abound. We must be wary Facile comparisons have led romantic diffusionists to claim an old world origin for almost everything found on American soil, from the universal legend of the flood down to the simple bow and arrow. How can we avoid the scylla of radical diffusionism on the one hand and the charbatus of reactionary isolationism on the other? A fairly safe guideline may be set up to pilot us through this perilous minefield. This guideline counsels us to be time specific and culture specific, to cite evidence where possible of a long evolution of the habit, artifact, system, or technique in the area of the donor, and to demonstrate a lack of known antecedents in that of the recipient 
to consider levels of identity in complexity as against superficial stylistic similarity to think in terms not of single traits but of complexes or clusters of interlocking parallels a number of important items may be seen to survive this critical test let us consider first of all the pyramids they have a very long history in the Mediterranean world the type found in America the step pyramid may be traced to ancient Babylon and Egypt it is also known by the name of ziggurat the ziggurat step pyramid or stepped temple is a distinctive a type of religious architecture as a Chinese pagoda or a Mohammedan mosque it has been found nowhere in the old world without clear and incontestable proof of diffusion it goes back 3,000 years before Christ among the most noted Egyptian step periods pyramids are the pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara 2750 BC and the period of Medum built for the Pharaoh Seneferu 2700 BC there were no pyramids in America before the contact period 800 to 680 BC the very first American pyramid or stepped temple appears at La Venta the site of the colossal Negroid heads and the stele on which is carved the Mediterranean type figure with beard and turned up shoes. Other notable step pyramids in America are the Pyramid of Cholula, dedicated to Quetzalcoatl, 150 BC, and the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan near Mexico City. We should also mention the Cerro Colorado Pyramid in the Chicama Valley in northern Peru where the influence of the visitors to the Gulf of Mexico later diffused it would appear from the above that the major criterion has been met there is clear evidence of long evolution of a unique architectural configuration in the area from which the aliens are presumed to have come and no evidence of antecedents in the area where they landed suddenly in the contact period, the ziggurat or steep temple, a particular kind of Babylonian Egyptian pyramid, begins to appear in America. And not only is the design identical, but like its presumed prototype, it is sun star oriented and encircled by a precinct. Not only are the shape and religious function the same, but also the astronomical and spatial relationships. There is, however, one serious objection. The Egyptians, it would appear, have stopped building pyramids since 1600 BC, particularly this kind of pyramid. In other words, the American pyramid, if it was influenced by aliens in the contact period, would have had to come from an architect in the migrant group who was nostalgically returning to classical or early Egyptian architecture. The heyday of the Egyptian step pyramid was long over. Over in Egypt, yes, but not in Nubia. The black kings of Nubia built the last of the Egyptian type pyramids above their tombs, small but elegant copies, and the last of the steep temples for sun worship. They also rebuilt and restored a great number of temples which had fallen into disrepair. Nostalgia for the religious and architectural past of Egypt was so strong in Pianchi and Taharqa. Pianchi rebuilt the great temple of Ammon, originally built by Thutmosis III and IV, with additions by Ramses II. Taharqa erected a magnificent colonnade in the great forecourt of the temple at Karnak. One of these columns is still standing today. He also restored halls of hypostyle, columns in the great temple of Amun-Ra at Jebel Barkal. 
the hypostyle or forest of columns is another architectural feature which we find appearing in America after the contact period. Like the Egyptians and the Native Americans, the Nubians oriented all their religious structures on earth to cardinal points in the heavens to assist in his architectural schemes to Harka in 684 BC called in four experts in reckoning the time by star transits and their astronomical instruments are mentioned. Many of these temples have been beaten into the dust by time, but even as late as 593 BC, a successor of Taharka, Espelta, built the Sun Temple at Moreau, which Herodotus calls the Table of the Sun. It is the steeped type of temple, and fragments of its ruins may still be found. A flight of stone steps or Jacob's ladder takes us up to the platform at the summit, and a colonnade encloses the sanctuary. Reliefs on the walls of this sun temple have motifs that occur on similar temples in ancient Egypt and America, like those showing conquered prisoners supporting the royal foot. Mummification is another extremely interesting case which merits close examination. Few mummies have been unearthed in ancient Mexico because of the corrosive humidity, but we have indisputable proof of Mexican mummification nonetheless. One of the best examples is the mummified figure in the sarcophagus at Palenque. Three features of this Palenque burial indicate an Egyptian influence. The jade mask on the face of the dead, the fact of mummification itself, and the flared base of the sarcophagus. With respect to the latter, it should be noted that Egyptians made sarcophagi with a flared base to enable them to stand them up because their bur burials were vertical. The Egyptians built their mummy cases of wood, and these cases were often stood on end. The flared base feature affording them stability in the standing position. The Mexicans, like the Nubians, bury in a horizontal position, yet at Palenque the flared base is retained although it serves no function. The retention of such a non-functional element, especially when, as in this case, considerable time and effort went into chiseling the flared base out of stone, is among the clearest indications of an influence. A borrowed artifact often goes through an initial period of slavish imitation before it is restructured to suit local needs. Both horizontal and vertical burials occur in the royal graveyards of Nubia. Egyptian and native Nubian burial customs coexist for a while and then fuse. Arkel has noted that more Egyptian the burial, the poor, poorer are the grave furnishings, indicating that the black kings whose tombs, though plundered, are obviously much richer, reta retaining around them a nucleus of Egyptian assistants, architects, scribes, priests. Egyptian mummification techniques, which originated in pre-dynastic black Africa and were developed and refined in the dynastic period, are most in evidence in Peru. There, in the desert sands, we find very specific and ample evidence of the Egyptian influence. Evidence of mummification, however, is widespread in ancient North America as the practice diffused from the Mexican heartland. The Indian tribes of Virginia, of North Carolina, the Congarees of South Carolina, the Indians of the Northwest Coast, of Central America and those of Florida practiced this custom as well as the Incas. In Colombia, the inhabitants of Darien used to remove the viscera and fill the body cavity with resin. Afterwards, they smoked, that is, fumigated the body and preserved it in their houses. The Muiscas, the Aleutians, the inhabitants of Yucatan, and Chiapas 
also embalmed the bodies of their kings, of their chiefs, and of their priests by similar methods. Dr. Haddon, in 1908, showed that certain refined techniques in mummification, which were later found in America, and also in East and West Africa, and the Canary Islands, were not adopted in Egypt until the time of the 21st dynasty, 1090 to 945 BC. Some scholars have claimed that the practice of mummification diffused to America from Asia. But Elliot Smith has very ably demonstrated the early spread of this practice to the Far East from Egypt. As we shall go on to show, the identity of the Egyptian with the American technical formula in some places rules out an Asian middleman preceding the Nubian Egyptian because it is not simply the act or practice of mummification which is in question but the transmission of an identity and complexity of the technical formula. Mummification as a chemical process had been taken to such a state of refinement in Egypt that in March 1963 biologists at the University of Oklahoma confirmed that the skin cells of the ancient Egyptian princess many were capable of living. The ancient Egyptians after thousands of years had come close to the threshold of the secret of physical immortality. The chemical formula by which this remarkable state of preserving princess many was achieved had been arrived at through centuries of experimentation. Yet we find in Peru not only the same manner of evisceration through the anus and the same manner of swaddling the corpse in ritual bandages, but according to Professor L. Ruder, who has made an analysis of embalming mixtures in Peru, the antiseptic substances used in embalming are identical with those used in ancient Egypt. Balsam, menthol, salt, tannin, alkaloids, saponins, and undetermined resins. The ingredients are common enough. The formula is very complex and elusive. What is perhaps even more astonishing is that the Egyptians buried parts of the corpse in four canopic jars. These were called Horus jars, since they were dedicated to the Horuses of the four cardinal points. Certain internal organs were placed in the north jaw, small viscera, the south jaw, stomach and large intestines, the west jaw, liver and gall, and the east jaw, heart and lungs. Colors were associated to these cardinal points. This color configuration associated with the Horus jars reappears in the cardinal color scheme of ancient Mexico. Thus we have a red north in ancient Egypt and Mexico, a white south, a dark west, black in Egypt, blue in Mexico, and a golden east. Yellow is the equivalent color for gold in Mexico. This is no simple accident. Chinese and other Asian Aboriginal color schemes differ radically in this connection. Moreover, mummies examined in ancient Peru toward the end of the Olmec phase of civilization show that foreign elements, both Negroid and Caucasoid, seem to have entered the native South American population, 400 to 300 BC. Dr. M. Trotter, doing a hair analysis on pieces of a scalp, from Paracas mummies in Peru reported in 1953 that the cross-section form shows so much divergency between the different mummies that they cover all divisions of hair form. Dr. Trotter under cross-questioning by Thor Heyerdahl indicated that hair color and texture need alter only slightly through post-mortem dehydration and fading. Also, an examination of skeletons in the area, simultaneously conducted by T.D. Stewart, demonstrated the presence of races of greater average height and a different cephalic index head shape 
than the Aboriginal Americans. Heyerdahl's questioning of Trotter in his interview with the mummy specialist W. R. Dawson elicited information that can clearly establish the Mediterranean presence in America through these mummies. But his overwhelming desire to prove the Europoid presence, probably Phoenician, makes him defensively selective in presenting his information, which equally suggests Negroid elements, mulatto, curly-haired Egyptians, and a good deal of racial intermixtures. Dogs were also mummified by the Egyptian pharaohs. The Nubian kings, on the other hand, were fascinated by horses, and Pianchi, who raged after his victory at Hermopolis because his horses had been badly fed during the siege, started burying horses in the royal graves instead. The full team of four that drew the royal chariot were buried beside the king, and through the grave, though the grave robbers stripped the chariots of their useful parts, remains of the rich trappings were found, including plume carriers, silver headbands, beads, and amulets. Yet, in spite of this departure from the Egyptian type of burial, the coexistence of the two cultures was preserved by a symbolic Nubian homage to the dog. The Egyptian dog-headed god Anubis graces the Nubian funerary offering tables. These offering tables found in the graves with invocations to the gods written in the Nubian script, Moradic, show the god Nephthys and the dog-headed god Anubis both concerned with the cult of the dead, pouring libations. In this very period, the Olmecs began to sculpt little clay dogs attached to wheels or to tiny chariots with wheels. In this particular blend of dog and chariot lies virtually their only use of the wheel. The lack of the horse or other draught animals of comparable size precluded a more practical use. How they struck upon this ritual association, dog, wheel, chariot, is an intriguing question. The full-blown Egyptian practice, however, of mummifying dogs has been found in Peru. What is even more intriguing is that these dogs mummified in Peru do not all look like the typical American spits and husky types. Some look uncannily like the Basenji, the species of Egyptian dog worshipped by the pharaohs. The only surviving species of this dog is found today in Africa, where it is used by the pygmies of the Itori forest to track and chase game. It is a very distinctive type and with regal appearance. It stands with feet well apart and ears so taut that they look like webbed antennae. This dog became a great pet in ancient Egypt because it has no body odor and it makes no noise. It is known as the barkless dog. It is upon this animal that the dog-headed god of Egypt and Nubia was modeled. Columbus reports a species of barkless dog during his voyages to the Caribbean. The Basenji answers to the description in his journals. Other similarities in burial customs have been noted such as twisted rope designs on sarcophagi, golden mummy masks such as the Chimu mask of Peru, and a small hole in the top slabs of death chambers for the release of the soul or the flight of the bird of death. Twisted rope designs are first noted in America on altar one of the Laventa site and they later appear on Mexican coffins. The style, according to one investigator, barely, is quote-unquote North Syrian. The resemblance is rather superficial, although it is not difficult to conceive of a member of the ancient party carrying it over from that area which neighbored the Egyptian Phoenician states. With respect to the golden mummy mask, coffins cast in Nubian gold with the detailed features of the mummified kings are not unknown in Egypt. 
An example is the golden coffin of Tutankhamun with elaborate facial detail. The golden mummy mask as such however is not common to either Egypt or Nubia. Though in the latter case these masks might have disappeared with the plundered mummies since the golden mummy mask as a ritual practice appears later in the tombs of African chiefs and kings Irwin has suggested a Phoenician influence for the golden mummy mask in Mexico and this cannot be ruled out. Phoenicians, though mercenary seamen in this period in the pay of the Nubian Egyptian forces were an element in the mixed party while they were obviously of a lower order of importance as the Olmec sculptures suggest they must have had some influence. Golden mummy masks appear in some of the Phoenician tombs though mummification was practiced in Phoenicia only occasionally and in a much cruder form than in Egypt. The holes in death chambers for the flight of the soul or death bird are not on the same level of uniqueness or ritual complexity as other burial customs we have discussed and could quite easily have been a coincidence. One other burial practice common to ancient Egypt and Mexico is worth mentioning if only for the sake of showing how carefully we must apply our test in the study of cultural similarities. This burial ritual involved the placing of a green stone in the mouth of the corpse. Both the Egyptians and the Mexicans saw this green stone as a symbol of the heart and as the prolonger of life. The Egyptians, among whom it took the form of a green scarab, addressed it thus, quote, My heart, my mother, my heart, whereby I came into being, end quote. The Mexicans placed the Chalchiltu green amulet between the lips of the deceased and they also associated it with life restorative properties. In fact they called it quote the principle of life unquote. The green stone in the mouth of the dead however is a very primitive ritual indeed. One may even say primordial. It precedes Egyptian civilization by thousands of years. It was found between the teeth of some of the Cro-Magnon skeletons in the Grimaldi caves near Menton. The very ancient Chinese also placed green jade amulets in the mouth to preserve the body from decay. Pearls and shells as mouth amulets of the dead were substituted for jade. Pearls for feudal laws, lords, shells for ordinary officials, jade reserved for stuffing the mouths of dead emperors. Since we find such a custom in vogue even as far back as the origination stage of Cro-Magnon culture, it might well have traveled from Asia to America in the glacial epoch when the very first Americans crossed over to this continent on the bridge of ice in their two major migrations now calculated to be 40 and 25,000 years ago. Some ritual practices that are almost identical in America and Egypt which we may safely date from the Olmecs onward and which point to an outside influence are the wearing of false beards by high priests. The ritual use of a purple as an exclusively royal and priestly color incest between royal siblings and a complex of royal paraphernalia such as the ceremonial umbrella and litter and the bird serpent motif in coats of arms and royal diadems. Here we have not one but a cluster of closely linked parallels some of which are unique to these two areas and some of which like the wearing of artificial beards are highly unusual among the beardless American Indians. Heyerdahl has with a graphic brilliance indicated the statistical improbability of so many parallels occurring in two culture areas independently especially when they are known to be joined by a marine conveyor belt. A single culture element found to appear at both ends of a natural sea route, wrote Heyerdahl, 
may very well be the result of coincidence or independent evolution along parallel lines. To become a reasonable indicator of conduct, contact, a whole array of identities or similarities of extraordinary nature must be concentrated in the two areas linked by land bridge or marine conveyor belt. What confronts us on both sides of the Atlantic are arrays of cultural parallels. And when these are dealt with as complexes, we are faced by amazing statistical indications. When the whole list of Mediterranean American parallels are considered together as an entity, then the probability of diffusion rather than independent development does not increase arithmetically but exponentially. For instance, a cluster of 12 parallels grouped together, say, in Mesopotamia and Mexico, does not weigh 12 times heavier in the discussion than a single parallel, but rather, according to the laws of probability, has increased its significance by a truly astronomical amount. Among other things, this means that the isolationist technique of negating these parallels one by one by labeling them coincidence is mathematically invalid. The artificial beard worn by kings and priests is one of the ancient mysteries of Mexico. For the native Mexican, as we know him, has no hair on his chin. The Ainu of Japan are hairy Asiatics, and there is evidence for a pre-Columbian presence of Japanese in America. The Ainu could have been one of the earliest American races emigrating to this continent from Asia. Also, the black stream, the Koru Siwu, has occasionally cast remnants of J Japanese crews onto the American Pacific coast. White bearded figures hunted down in a part of 16th century South America were found to be Japanese. And there is evidence, Jomon pottery, for a late pre Columbian Japanese influence in Ecuador. All this, however, does not seem to explain the high ritual value placed upon the beard. The pharaohs and sometimes the high priests of Egypt and Nubia wore false beards. These were highly stylized appendages, smooth, long, and terminating in a blunt, square tuft. The abstract idea of the beard as a badge of high office may have been influenced by Nubian Egyptian culture. But the literal image of the beard, textured and tapered, as it is usually represented, was inspired no doubt by quite ordinary human figures. Figures most likely from the same party of foreigners. Among these, we may consider the Mediterranean Caucasoid figure at La Venta. In fact, he is the only one who, so far, has been considered as a likely candidate for the influence of the un-American beard. We should also bear in mind that the smooth-chinned Negroid figures in stone are not the only type of Negro-African who came in during this period. Von Wuthenau has demonstrated through, through his terracottas that there were other ancient Negroid figures in America equipped with beards. Another practice common to Egypt, Nubia, and Mexico is that of royal incest. It is unique to these societies. Royal incest among siblings, brother and sister, is the rarest social institution in the world. In spite of the horror incest arouses in all human societies, Secret incestuous relationships may be fairly common, but there are only three societies in the world, Egypt, Nubia, and Mexico, where incest was actively encouraged in the royal family, incest between full-blooded brother and sister. 
the black Nubian king, Tanutamen, was succeeded, who succeeded Taharqa, was the product of such an incestuous union. See chapter 8. Egyptian royal incest belongs to an earlier period, and therefore we may say that only two societies in the world at the time, 800 to 700 BC, practiced royal incest between siblings, Nubia and Mexico. The Egyptians, who had practiced it, practiced it in the belief that they were kings of the sun, and that it would keep solar blood from dilution, had abandoned the practice before the contact period. The Egyptian pharaohs started to marry Mitannanian wives from hither Asia and thus broke with the purity of solar blood. Thus we find solar blood diluted in the veins of the pharaohs at the end of the 23rd dynasty. The black kings of Kush resurrected this custom and for the very same reason as it was practiced earlier in Egypt and later in Mexico. Other practices common to the two culture areas are the use of the umbrella and litter as royal prerogatives. Today, these items are so common and have such vulgar functions, the umbrella for weather protection, the litter for the sick or wounded, that it is difficult to conceive of their unique ritual use and value as an index of high rank in the Egyptian, Nubian, and Mexican worlds. Professor Varin has demonstrated the use of the umbrella as an emblem of dignity and power in ancient times, and a visual comparison of the Mexican royal umbrella with that hovering over the black Nubian princess in the tomb painting of Hoy, also of the litters used for transport of royalty in Mexico with those used in Mesopotamia. Prototypes of the Egyptian litters startled by their identity of appearance and function. The religious value of Morex purple and its use to distinguish priests and kings and people of high rank from the common herd has its origins in the Mediterranean first evidence of the extraction of the purple dye from the Morex shell occurs in Crete in 1600 BC, but the religious value attached to it was a consequence of the peculiar behavior of the Nile. In ancient Egypt, the riddle of life was read in the Nile, which, as it rose in the flood, turned green, red, and yellowish, and then blue. The fluid of the Morex shell barring a tin or two, behaved in almost the same way, turning from a yellowish cream to green then blue like the Nile before acquiring its final fixed purple. It thus revealed by its sequence of colors, green, yellowish, blue, the various attributes of the Nile deity. This accounts for the enormous sanctity attached to shell purple, which according to Besnier, was considered not only a noble and sacred color by the Egyptians, but emblematic of the power of the gods. The Phoenicians of Tyre and Sidon adopted the industry, and Tyrian purple became famous in the Mediterranean, particularly in Egypt, with which the Phoenicians did most of their trade. It thenceforth diffused through the Old World. Purple-yielding shells were searched for far and wide and in the western Mediterranean. Purple dye centers were established. The Phoenicians obtained from the British Isles, while shipping for their tin in Cornwall, a dark shade of shell purple called black purple. Kitchen middens in Cornwall have yielded traces of the ancient industry. Traces of the ancient people, ancient purple industry, have also been found in Mexico, and here the same value and function is attached to it. Also the same extraordinary association with the conch shell trumpet to summon the deity. Zelia Nuttall has published a paper entitled 
a curious survival in Mexico of the use of the purpura shellfish for dyeing. She shows in the Natal Codex pictures of no fewer than 13 women of rank in Mexico wearing purple skirts and five with capes and jackets of the same color. In addition, 45 chieftains are figured with short, fringed, rounded, purple waist cloths. And there are also three examples of the use of a close-fitting purple cap. Purple yielding shells, broken for the dyeing industry, have also been taken from the Inia graves, excuse me, Inca graves in North Chile. Purple is one of those colors that do not come naturally and easily. As J. Wilford Jackson points out in Shells as Evidence of the Migration of Early Cultures. The method of its production is a complex and difficult process. Moreover, the ancient purple industry, because of its marine nature, was conducted by Mediterranean mariners and became associated with pearl fishing and the use of the artificially devised conch shell trumpet. The earliest use of the conch shell trumpet, according to Professor Smith, was in the Minoan worship in Crete, where the purple industry started. Thence it spread far and wide until it came to play a part in religious services in the Mediterranean, in India, in Central Asia, in Indonesia, and Japan, in Oceania, and America. It was supposed to have the definite ritual object of summoning the deity. In addition to the ritual use of the conch shell trumpet, identical in the Egyptian and American worlds, Jackson finds an intimate relationship between this purple industry and conch shell trumpets and weaving, as well as mining, working, and trafficking in metals, gold, silver, copper, in Mexico and Peru. The purple industry was also associated with these pursuits. The ritual use of purple as an index of rank, therefore, and the extraction of purple and the religious use of the artificial conch shell to summon the deity, and the further association of all this with weaving and metalworking, is one of the most remarkable complexes of interlocking parallels found between Mediterranean and ancient New World civilizations. The Phoenician Egyptian Nubian link and the joint influence in the mixed crew of shipwrecks is almost clearly seen in this connection. The Egyptian Nubian religious link to the Nile, which gave the Morex purple shell its sanctity, the Phoenician maritime enterprise, which exploited the Cretan discovery of the shell milk as an indelible dye, and the conch shell trumpet as a summoner of the divine, the use of Tyrian purple among the pharaohs and high priests of Egypt and Nubia are all seen in the later duplication of this royal and priestly use of purple, which, with all of its complex associations by the Mexicans and Peruvians. Since weaving and metalworking were among the pursuits associated with the purple dye manufacturers, weaving techniques such as the loom and metallurgical techniques such as the refined metal casting process known as the lost wax technique were carried from one end of the Mediterranean to the other and so diffused through the old world. An examination of these two technological achievements in the old world and the new provides us with further proof of an influence. Although Native Americans in Peru were weaving cloth as early as 2500 BC, they were not using the loom. Dr. Junius Bird discovered cotton fabrics at Huaca Prieta in Peru, carbon dated 2500 BC. But 78% of 
Of the three thousand pieces of cotton cloth examined were twined and the rest netted. Two of the simplest methods of producing fabrics without a loom. When a loom of the horizontal type appeared in Peru, it was found to be identical with a horizontal loom depicted in an Egyptian tomb. When the vertical loom appeared in Peru, it was identical with those found in a tomb at Thebes. The Sacred Capital of the Black Kings Both the New World and Old World looms had the same 11 working parts. To be even more specific, it has been shown that the vertical frame loom with two warp beams used by the Incas was the same as that used in Egypt in the New Kingdom, 18th to 20th Dynasty, circa 1400 to 1100 BC. The second of the two types of Peruvian looms, the horizontal loom staked out on the ground as used in the Titicaca Basin, was also the same as that of ancient Egypt. Spindle whorls, also used in weaving, were so identical in Egypt, the Mexican capital of Tula, and in Peru, that laid side by side, even an expert can scare, scarcely tell them apart. The metal casting technique known as the lost wax, or Sire Perdue method, is far more complex than the loom and far more unlikely to appear in a place where metals were just luxuries, having a ritual rather than a utilitarian value. Metals in Egypt and Nubia could make all the difference to success and defeat in battle. Metal trafficking was one of the mainstays of Phoenician trade. Metal hunger was the inspiration of many maritime explorations and migrations. But the ancient Americans, as Frederick Dellenbaugh has pointed out, were unacquainted with the common use of metals. They worked metals all right, silver, gold, and copper, but to a limited extent and in an ornamental way. Ancient American weapons are not of copper and bronze, but of flint and obsidian and stone. Metals were mainly used to protect and animate the living and the dead and were offered as gems to the gods. There is no archaeological witness to the stages preceding their sudden leap into highly refined casting techniques developed by people producing metals in vast quantities for a mass utility purpose. It took centuries of experimentation in the Mediterranean, for example, to reduce tin simply to a subsidiary element or alloy in the production of bronze, from its sovereignty as a metal in itself. Yet there is not a single object made entirely of tin by the ancient Americans. The Americans jumped that step mysteriously, and we find them, according to C.W. Mead, a curator of Peruvian archaeology, who has analyzed bronze pieces in ancient Peruvian graves, using only 6 or 7 percent of tin in their bronzes, a technical achievement re reached by only the best of the Mediterranean bronze workers. The ancient European bronzes had an average of tin alloys as high as 10 percent. As for the lost wax technique used in Egypt and Nubia, from where it diffused to the Yoruba and Bini of Nigeria via Moro, capital of the Black Kings after their retreat from Egypt, it is a technique that appears nowhere in the Old World without some indication of diffusion from the Mediterranean center. Metal casting is a highly technical operation and the lost wax me method is far superior to the common sand process. It is considered especially good for reproducing faithfully delicate and intricate detail. 
The following brief summary of the technique is presented to give some impression of the complexity of the process, which has been found copied by the ancient metal casters of the New World. The first step in the lost wax method of casting is the making of a mold, which bears in reverse the details of the object to be cast. This is usually dusted with finely ground charcoal and made ready for the wax cast. The inside of the mold is painted with molten wax, which is then reinforced with sheets of warm wax pressed against it. The thickness of the wax must be controlled so that it does not exceed the desired thickness of the final cast in bronze, gold or silver. The mold is then taken off, leaving a hollow wax replica. An opening or vent is made in the object to carry off the melting wax during the baking of the final mold. This final mold is made of a heat resisting semi-liquid compound poured into the wax mold to form the core and built up around the outside to form a jacket. The whole thing is put into a blast furnace. Even this has been found to be identical in design in Egypt and America, and baked for a couple of days until the wax has melted away. The mold is then removed from the furnace. Molten gold, bronze, or silver is poured into the opening in the mold and fills the space left empty by the melting of the lost wax cast. When the metal cools, the jacket is broken away and the job is done. Many of the Mediterranean type technical processes, burial customs and royal priestly rituals that mark Olmec culture in the Mexico of the North are found in the Chavin Kapisnik culture in the Peru of the South. These are contemporary centers of American civilization. Early Chavin levels have been carbon dated 848 plus or minus 167 years BC and the movement of major aspects of culture from the one to the other has been clearly established they even share the central feline motif an Egyptian surgical procedure found in both ancient Mexico and Peruvian civilization is trepanning or trepanation. It was performed on the skulls of Egyptian Nubian soldiers, among others to relieve pressure caused by blows on the skull. Hippocrates recommended it in an essay on injuries of the head. Doctors in ancient Egypt, Mexico, and Peru removed plaques of bone from the skull and in many cases the operation was remarkably successful. Skulls examined in Peru indicate absence of signs of infection and a new growth of normal bone in and about the wound. There are very few cases in which post-operative infection of the skull set in, leading to lethal decay, indicated by a vast cavity. An examination of skulls in Egypt, Mexico, and Peru upon which this operation was performed show square and circular holes in the skull. The skull bone was penetrated by scraping, cutting, or drilling the bone. The Egyptians have left us their surgical papyri. The surgical books of the New World lie in the thousands of skulls examined in America, particularly in Peru, where the paleontological evidence is more ample. Skull deformation deliberately practiced by the Egyptian and ancient American upper class to distinguish them physically from their subjects is another remarkable trait which seems restricted to these two cultural areas. Another shared feature often noted and calling for serious examination is that of fitting megalithic masonry. The finest examples are found at Giza in Egypt, at Lixis in Morocco where it diffused at Sac Sahuaman and Cuzco in Peru, 
and across the Pacific from Peru and on Easter Island. The technique calls for considerable skill since the massive stone blocks fitted together are not of any regular shape or size, not cut into conventional squares for example, but display the complex regularity of patterns or designs in a jigsaw puzzle. No cement is used in the building of these massive blocks, so wonderfully exact is the masonry work of which they are composed. The identical methods of quarrying in the new and old worlds, which Seaton Lloyd's study has demonstrated, may account for this extraordinary building technique. Both the ancient Egyptians and Americans quarried stone by driving wooden wedges into natural faults in the stone, which cracked when the wedges filled with water. It may be that a whole natural wall of stone or a cliff face was transported in its entirety from the quarry in its separate bits and pieces. This would account for the irregularly divided blocks being put together again by the masons into a tightly fitting pattern. These pieces or blocks were probably broken off the quarry wall at these points where natural forts were exploited to break up the stone. They were then reconstructed as one reconstructs the irregularly shaped but naturally fitting pieces of a jigsaw. Similar responses to a similar problem may lead to an independent but similar solution. There may have been no other practical method by which massive stone blocks could have been quarried in the old world. Through fitted megalithic masonry in itself as unique to an area in the old world where a certain complex of cultural traits has been found, while the method of quarrying stone therefore might have been coincidental, this method of building walls and fortifications certainly was not. The identical technique occurred to no other people outside of this interconnected complex. Far more arbitrary, however, than a construction technique of this unusual nature is the construction of certain of the world's calendars. Even if astronomical science was as advanced in the Olmec world as it was in Egypt and Nubia before the 800 and 700 BC contact, it could not have led to the whole series of coincidences to be observed in one of the Mexican calendars. The Abbe Hervas, a Franciscan priest writing to the historian Clavigero, highlights the remarkable conformity between the ancient Egyptian and Mexican calendars. The Mexican year, the Abbe Hervis wrote, began upon the 26th of February, a day celebrated in the era of Nabu Nassar, which was fixed by the Egyptians 747 years before the Christian era. For the beginning of their month, Toth corresponded with the meridian of the same day. If those periods fixed also on this day as an epoch, because it was celebrated in Egypt, we have here the Mexican calendar agreeing with the Egyptian. But independent of this, it is certain that the Mexican calendar conformed greatly with the Egyptian. On this subject, Herodotus says that the year was first regulated by the Egyptians who gave to it 12 months of 30 days and added five days to every year that the circle of the year might revolve regularly. That the principal gods of the Egyptians were 12 in number and that each month was under the tutelage and protection of one of these gods. The Mexi Mexicans also added to every year five days, which they called Nemon Temi, or useless, because during these days they did nothing. Plutarch says that on such days the Egyptians celebrated the festival of the birth of the gods. The Abbey Hervas goes on to show that the Mexican month was in ancient times like the Egyptian, but for some reason 
the time reckoning was later altered. The Mexic Mexicans received the lunar month from their ancestors, but for certain purposes instituted another. Under the first and older system, dating like the Egyptian from February 26, 747 BC, the Mexicans arrived at the same total for the year as did the ancient Egyptians. 360 days, a number as the Abbey Hervas points out, which from time immemorial has ruled in geometry and astronomy, and is of the utmost particularity on account of its relation to the circle which is divided into 360 parts or degrees. The Egyptian influence may be traced not only to those three aspects we have noted, namely the time the Me Mexicans began to count the years, February 26, 747 BC, the 12 lunar manches corresponding to the 12 Egyptian gods, the five useless or dateless festival days, it may also be seen in the symbols of the Mexi Mexican months. Respecting the symbols of the Mexican months and year, the Abbey Hervis observes, they discover ideas entirely conformable with those of the ancient Egyptian. The latter distinguished as appears from their monuments each month or part of the zodiac where the sun stood which characterized figures of that which happened in every season of the year. Therefore we see the signs of Aries, Taurus, and the two young goats, which are now Gemini, used to mark the months of the birth of those animals. The signs of Cancer, Leo, and Virgo, with the ear of corn for those months in which the sun goes backwards like a crab in which there is greater heat and in which the harvests are reaped. The sign of the scorpion which in the Egyptian sphere occupied the space which at present is occupied by the sign of Libra and that of Sagittarius in the months of virulent or contagious distempers, and lastly, the signs of Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces, in those months in which the sun begins to ascend toward others, in which it rains much, and in which there is abundant fishing. These ideas are similar to those which the Me Mexicans associated with their clime. Other symbols, extremely arbitrary symbols, have been found in use by both the ancient Egyptians and the Mexicans. The sun devoured or encircled by a serpent is one of these. In the Mexican symbol, we see the sun as it were eclipsed by the moon and surrounded with the serpent which makes four twists and embraces the four periods of thirteen years. This very idea of the serpent, which the sun has from time immemorial, signified the periodical or annual course of the sun. We know that in astronomy the points where the eclipses happen have from time immemorial been called the head and tail of the dragon. The Egyptians agree with the Mexicans for, for to symbolize the sun they employed a circle with one or two serpents. The symbol of the serpent is a thing totally arbitrary to signify the sun with which it has no physical relation. Wherefore then I ask have nations which have had no reciprocal intercourse agreed in using one same symbol so arbitrary and chose to express it by the same object. This then is the case for contact between Egypt and the New World in the 800 to 700 BC period, a period in which the blacks of Nubia had gained ascendancy over the Egyptian Empire and appeared according to carbon-14 datings 
in the Olmec world of Mexico as monumental figures, venerated and revered. These are some of the important influences this alien crew of shipwrecks left upon the face of ancient American culture. Many other claims have been made, but we have confined ourselves to those that can pass a rigorous test and eliminated those such as the Egyptian sandal of coiled rope, the Egyptian throwing stick, the simple fish hook and blowgun, also all so called similarities in art styles and such or symbols without a complex history rooted in particular circumstances originating in the Egyptian Mediterranean world. A critical but open minded skepticism is needed in these comparative studies if we are to lift the tenor of the debate on pre Columbian contacts between Africa and the New World from the level of the fanciful and the romantic. All the features of Egyptian culture noted above were duplicated in the Nubian Egyptian culture complex of the 25th dynasty. This phenomenon of separate yet parallel identity emerges with a great clarity when the historical and archaeological data of the period are closely examined. The master colonial relationship between Egypt and Nubia had ceased. Nubia became the inheritor and custodian of a culture which took as much from black Africa as black Africa was later to take from it. Nubia was so much a part of Egypt that, as Professor Steindorf and Seal have pointed out, it tenaciously held fast to Egyptian culture in latter times when Egypt herself succumbed to foreign influences. When the Greeks came into the valley of the Nile in the 7th century BC, it was Nubia which was considered the seat of orthodox Egyptian character. End of chapter 9